I want to talk to you about basement waterproofing. There are several reasons why you might want to waterproof a basement. A lot of mortgage companies used to get a bit nervous about basements. They didn't like them because they considered they'd be a liability. I remember back in the day when you had a basement and you went to the mortgage company and they would kind of downgrade the property slightly according to that. But of course, we now live in more enlightened times. People are living in basements. I mean, the whole of London, there are basements where there weren't basements before. And some of that ends in disaster, like this particular building here, turned to rubble because somebody got a bit over ambitious with the basement. So we're not talking about building basements where there weren't any. We're talking about people who've got basements and want to waterproof them. You want to waterproof it either because you want it as storage or because you want it as living accommodation. Now, there's a big difference between those two. If you're having a basement waterproofed and you want it to comply with the building regulations, it's going to be inspected and passed off by building inspectors, maybe as a habitable space, then you really need to have that professionally designed. Get a professional basement waterproofing engineer involved. They're different people to architects and they just specialize in doing that job. That ain't going to be cheap. A friend of mine that uh, builds some very posh houses, sort of three, four million pounds, he built a swimming pool in a house and it was on the side of a hill. They put in the waterproof concrete and they made a great job of running continuously with this pour so that they got this lovely continuous poured waterproof concrete on the side of a hill. In the first few weeks you started seeing water forcing its way through that waterproof structure into the inside. They really couldn't stop it and the reason they couldn't stop it is because when you looked out in the garden you saw a hill which went up for about three or four hundred feet behind the house and the amount of hydrostatic pressure that builds up on that. Every column of water is based upon not the volume of water, but the height of the water. So in other words, if you've got a wall here and you've got hydrostatic pressure, you've got water that is building up behind that wall, the amount of pressure is directly proportional to the height not the volume of water that's behind it. So you could have Lake Windermere behind here, or you could just have a single column of water there, and the hydrostatic pressure is exactly the same. So even though this guy had, had all the experts in it, it had the thing professionally done, it got the professional mix of concrete in, he was still having problems, and it took a long time for him to sort out that leak of water coming into the swimming pool. Ironically, when he filled it up with water and the water was equalized on both sides of the pool, it kind of solved the problem to a certain extent. My next door neighbor, but one had a house built and he had a basement put in it and he decided that he was gonna have that done with the professionals and he got Seeker. They go to the concrete plant where the ready mix is being made and they put the waterproofer in and then they follow the concrete lorry to the site and they watch the pour and they make sure that that whole thing is poured in one go and is absolutely 100% waterproof. He lives in an area, he's only a few doors away from me and it's sand. There is no clay there, it's just sandy soil. So it's the best ground you could ever wish to have. So what happened to him is he had this lovely basement built. It was completely tanked or waterproofed as they say, all the way around. So it's a waterproof structure that goes all the way around there, poured concrete, the water poured in. Within weeks, that basement was flooded. And of course, he had water in the basement. And because it was such a great waterproof structure, there was no way of that water coming out. So he had to have it pumped out. He had to have the whole thing emptied. And that happened to him twice. They refurbed it. They put everything back in, the insulation, the the flooring and, and everything else. And the reason that it was happening is because let's suppose in we've got a ground level here. They stopped the waterproofing there. And believe it or not, that gap there was enough for that water to get in there and flood the whole basement. This is happening all around the house, by the way. So where the masonry began, where the, the concrete foundation finished and the actual cavity wall started, they were getting water pouring in there into the basement. And in the end, they couldn't solve it. They tried sealing that up. They tried hacking off the render, sealing that outside surface off. And in the end, what he ended up with is a sump pump in there. And to this day, when it rains, that pump kicks in 
and empties the water from the basement. Even after all that design, he ended up having to go for the, the pump, which is a more or less a remedial solution. It can happen, you can spend an awful lot of money having a basement done, thinking you're having it waterproofed, and if you don't get the right guys, if you don't get the right design in there and the right workmanship, you will find that you, you can be undone on those very simple things. So the other principle we've got to remember, when we've looked at the water table, we've assessed the risks and what we want to use the basement for, we then have to assume that if we're going to go for the highest class waterproofing that we can get as a living area, that we have to assume that that's going to fail. What do you do if it fails? Well, you, you have a plan B. So you have not one, but two different methods of waterproofing. And that way, you've mitigated the problem. If, it, if one fails, you've got the other as a backup. In an ideal world, we would want to waterproof our basement from the outside. Supposing we've got, like I have, a Victorian house, got a bit of brickwork in there. The best kind of protection is going to be on the outside. And you may have seen the delta membrane and these studded membranes, brown stuff that they put on the outside, looks a little bit like an egg box. And it's a sheet that goes down there that has little plastic studs on it. And it goes down there and you kind of just drape it that way so that any water that's coming down here is fed away from the foundations. That's a very, very good thing to do. You join the sheets together with a mastic and a tape and you make sure that that is up against the outside of the building. Even better than that is to coat the wall first of all with a solution, a membrane, and say a liquid, some kind of bitumen if you like, and then put the stud, the membrane against the wall and down to there. Now when that water arrives down there, it's a good idea to have what they call a French drain. And it's not called a French drain because it comes from France. It's called a French drain because the person who designed it was a Mr. French. The one thing about French drains you see over and over again is well-meaning builders who say, oh yeah, you got a problem there. We're going to stick in a French drain. And they dig down a little bit and because nobody really likes digging. They put the French drain somewhere around here and it's a pipe and it's got little holes in it all the way around. Put it in with a bit of gravel around it, maybe a bit of a, a, a geotextile membrane as well to stop the thing getting silted up. And then all this water that percolates down through the ground when it rains, finds its way into the French drain and runs away to wherever the French drain terminates, as far away from the building as you could possibly manage it. And that's all very well, but they put these French drains in and then they find that they've got water coming through here. And you say, well, hang on a minute. We had all that work done. We've got that French drain in there. What's going on? Well, in actual fact, if you put the French drain in there, you're adding to the problem. You're actually making it very easy for all the water to accumulate there rather than if that was not there it would just kind of even itself out and find its way away some of it you've actually encouraged all that water to collect in that place there and when that french drain fills up it's going to just start percolating through here and it's very very difficult to stop that happening if you put some kind of fillet in here with a waterproof cement any kind of proprietary waterproofing thing and you run it up there and you run it down there you can sometimes stop that happening but a lot of the time because of the hydrostatic pressure it will force its way through there no matter what you do so the very very important thing is we don't put our french drain there we put our french drain here or even better we put it down there we put it well away in other words there's our basement slab if you like We've put some concrete in there. We want that French drain well below so that if it floods up, it's not going to flood up to the extent that it's going to get through there. A little bit more digging, but if you don't do that, if you see anybody putting a French drain in and they're only just sticking it as very often happens around there, thinking they're doing good, they're actually doing harm. So let's assume that we don't want to dig on the outside of the building. Let's assume that for one reason and another, it's a very difficult proposition to dig on the outside of the building. What we're gonna try and do there is we're gonna try and damp proof the basement from the inside. To some extent, you can do that by putting a surface coating. And there are cements which have 
a kind of crystallization effect in them and you put those on Vandex and people like that. You put that on in two coats, it's a sort of render treatment if you like. And what that does is as it gets wet, those crystals inside the cement kind of reconstitute themselves and they self seal. So when you first put it on the wall, you may think, oh, this is still leaking through. But after a few weeks, you find that that cement barrier has started to do a very effective job and stop that water coming through. But you can't stop there. You can't just rely on one treatment of cement and then plaster over that and think you're home and dry, as I might say. So what you do there is you put yourself another layer of protection in and it could either be the stud the membrane the same same one that we used on the outside but one that's made for internal purposes again it's got these little studs here to keep it off the wall so that any water that gets in here trickles down there where does it go then now that's the very important thing because what we then need to do is we need to put a perimeter drain in all the way around the bottom of the basement, all the way around the floor, and that perimeter drain will take that water away to a waterproof chamber below the floor level. In this chamber, we have a pump, and that pump triggers when that water starts running in there, a float switch detects that the water is filling up. The pump will kick in, it will throw the water out into some kind of drain and away it goes. Now that's done quite a lot, but in actual fact, if you're gonna have this passed off, if this is gonna be a habitable space, you don't need one pump, you need two pumps. You need a backup and very possibly even a way of coping with power cuts. So if you've got a power cut, you want a battery backup on that pump or something else. And it really is that onerous. To do that job properly, two pumps, and some kind of backup power source. Now that sounds extreme and you say, well, how often do power cuts happen? But you've got to think about the consequences of that filling up with water and that pump not kicking in and not operating. If that happens, you've got a flooded basement, that's a big insurance claim. That is a very, very important principle. Belt and braces, another thing that you find with basements. I have a basement at home, I used it as an office and I noticed that in the summer, the basement was getting damp. And the reason it was getting damp was simply because of condensation. What you find is that because the basement is at a cooler temperature, it tends to stay at a more regular temperature. So in the middle of the winter, if you go down there, it feels slightly warmer. But in the summer, when you go down there, it feels like it's air conditioned. And of course, what happens, as we know, as air gets warmer, it contains more moisture. So what happens is that that moisture finds its way down into that basement. As in my case, there's a bit of semi-basement there. So there's a window here. So the moisture finds its way down. Even if it wasn't a window, it would still find its way down through the house into the basement and when it gets into the basement it meets the cooler surfaces the whole air temperature is cooler the walls are cooler the floor is cooler and you go down there in the summer and you notice that the thing is slightly damp not soaking but slightly damp if like me you had an office down there you had papers down there you pick the paper up and you feel just just a little bit on the damp side it's not so crunchy as it was so it's very important in those situations that you if you're storing things down in that basement that you're concerned about in the summer, when it warms up, you make sure that you put some kind of fan in there, some kind of extractor fan or even a dehumidifier in there to remove some of that moisture from the air in the summer. Not such a problem in the winter, ironically, because you've got a bit of heating down there and it tends to keep the whole cellar fairly dry. The other thing I mentioned, by the way, is insulation, because a lot of people would say, well, okay, I need to try and insulate my cellar. In actual fact, because it's below ground level, you've got a certain level of insulation from the ground. Say that ground temperature is at five degrees centigrade, and that is at, say, 21 degrees centigrade there, you're going to get a flow of heat from there to there and that is more or less unavoidable so what people try to do is they try to put some insulation on the inside so when they've put that damp proof barrier on there they might think oh let's do a nice little thing here and we put a little bit of insulation some rock wall or cellotex or anything else on the inside of the wall just to warm the place up a bit 
And that's a great thing, except that what that does is, obviously, as you know, if there's any airborne moisture coming through here, when it reaches that cooler side of the insulation, that's the dew point, that's where the condensation starts to form. So you notice that what you've got, if you took any of that insulation off the wall, the whole thing would be damp behind the insulation. So you've stopped the damp getting this way and then you find you've created a barrier of damp or a layer of damp if you like all the way around the walls of the basement. Very very difficult to insulate a basement effectively to stop that happening. The best way of doing it and again this comes down to the dig if you're doing that external waterproofing that you're doing there you can put insulation, an ordinary polystyrene insulation, which is reasonably cheap. You don't need to use the Celotex. In fact, never use the PUR or the PIR board because it doesn't react well in the moisture. But if you use the plain old polystyrene insulations, there are some very dense ones, some blue ones, which are very good. And you put those up against the wall. You can either put that waterproofing membrane over the top of it and then just tuck it in the wall there so that any water that comes down the wall is directed away. So then you've got a warmed up basement. You've, you've basically insulated all those structural walls without having to do any kind of internal work. If you can do that, that is by far and away the best thing to do. So if you're having external waterproofing done, that's the ideal opportunity to sling in a little bit of external insulation. Now we will be doing this job pretty soon. As Soon as I pluck up the courage, I have a job to do precisely like this where I'm gonna dig down the side. My big problem at the moment is I can't find any volunteers to help me dig. So I'm probably gonna end up doing the whole job myself, which is, a, I like a bit of digging, but I'm starting to get a bit too old for that kind of job. Any volunteers out there who wanna come and help me dig? I'll help you, Rush. <laughs> Thanks, Dylan. <laughs> no, he won't. <laughs> So I hope that's given you a brief overview into the theory of how to damp proof a basement and what you can do and what you can't do and how to avoid making some of those mistakes. Another friend of mine did a lovely basement and when he put the sockets in the wall, he broke through the membrane and he found great damp patches appearing around his electrical sockets, which is generally not a very good thing. So when you do have that waterproofing done in the basement, make sure that you don't go puncturing it and perforating it, putting up shelves or cupboards or any of those kind of things. It really is important that you treat that more or less like a swimming pool. Now we will be doing these jobs. Stay tuned to Skill Builder if you like. We've always intended to go up and see a friend of mine, Rudy, who is up in Leeds, and he runs a company called Back to Basement. So one day, Rudy, we're gonna get up there and see you and have a look at a few of your more interesting jobs. But uh, if you want a specialist contractor to do basements, there are plenty of them around, but uh, just have a look at their work first because some general builders, even though they're well-meaning people, aren't always that experienced that do in basement waterproofing. So watch out for those future basement waterproofing videos. We will be doing quite a number of them. We've got some things to do with Safeguard Europe as well because they've got some interesting products and they do actually do a training course, by the way, if you want to go on that, on basement waterproofing where you can gain some knowledge and even a little certificate.